This interview was recorded as part of the 2020 Theatre Times International Online Theatre Festival. It takes place between the Kosovan playwright Yeton Nezaraj and the Los Angeles-based producer and designer Charles Duncan of City Garage Theatre Company and revolves around the production of Department of Dreams, Nezaraj's play directed by Frédéric Michel at City Garage in 2019. It's a wide-ranging discussion uh, which begins with some of the challenges of living and working with COVID-19 and then moves on to discuss the production in Los Angeles and wider issues around the work of living playwrights and how it's produced uh, in uh, Europe and also in America. Enjoy. Well, I think you should be the one to start. <laughs> Americans okay. first. All right. Well, then I guess I'll start by asking you how um, the theater uh, scene is operating right now where you are and how it's affected, how the COVID virus has affected you and your work. Well, I think uh, it's pretty much the same situation everywhere. Uh, theaters are, uh, you know, closed since uh, March 15, I guess. And uh, as far as I'm following, this is the same situation everywhere in, in, in Europe. I think this situation will continue until at least uh, September. I think this is the, the very optimistic version. Uh, if you are allowed to start in September, but I think uh, realistically we will be allowed to enter theater and to have audience into the theater only in next year. Mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, I've heard that they are, Germany, Switzerland and some other countries are designing some new regulations uh, that would require theaters to disinfect the, the you know, the, the, the rooms and they would allow people to sit in some kind of specific ways of, I don't know, f every fourth or fifth seat. And then let's say a, a theater with 300 uh, uh, seats would only host, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 people. And so in those new circumstances, lots of theater are, uh, are thinking to not even start the season because that's, uh, you know, expensive to maintain. You have to uh, pay people, and then you don't get any any man money back from the from the from the uh, you know selling tickets and so on and so on. So I think uh, you know very much this is everywhere, and so is in Kosovo as well. I mean, at the moment we are all. Uh, locked in our houses uh we are allowed to go 90 minutes during the day so we have specific uh, schedule when we are allowed to to go it changes every three three days uh what is uh, like in personal terms uh in march i was rehearsing in zurich with some uh, the group of uh, Kosovo and Swiss uh, uh, actors, a production that was being done by a, a small theater called Winkelwies there. So we had to stop after 10 days of uh, rehearsal and now the project is postponed for next September. In the meantime, two other projects were canceled completely, both in Germany and one with uh, Volksbühne, so the premiere was supposed to be uh, end of May, so this was cancelled just yesterday, and another project, and that was a big surprise for me, uh, was cancelled, and this is a project that was supposed to happen in 2021, and I'm surprised because in, 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 in Kosovo, in general, in the, in the southeastern Europe, you know, planning is mostly now by now, so to say, I mean, yes, the, the pandemic affected us now, this month, next month, or next two, three months, but not that far in, in, in advance, let's say. So this uh, German theater canceled completely a project of, uh, that was meant to happen in 2021. So, in, in, you know, this is the difference of, I mean, we are lucky, so to say, that we don't plan that far in advance. So. It is affecting us, but it is affecting us 
now in you know in in circumstances uh of this or next month or next couple of months but not not a year ahead what is happening here is that uh, lots of theaters are live streaming shows uh kosovo theaters created a, a, some sort of network and they made a joint calendar for the first time uh where they are streaming their shows so in um, april we had i don't know i think every day a show so nearly 30 30 shows and we were also surprised to see uh people really eager to to watch them and i think this is new trend that uh people are interested to 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 watch online theater and for me yes it is a little bit surprised because myself i i hated that and i thought you know this is the last thing i should do to watch an online theater play but i hear from some other colleagues let's say in poland this is also a, a trend and people are very much interested but same is here in in kosovo let's say a, a first play that national theater streamed live got some i don't know 100 thousand views or something like this so really huge huge number now it's less and less because we, we kept bombing them with shows online every every day but at least uh, you know people are are watching are going back to them or i don't know uh, we in our case of chandra multimedia where we work and i produce there we are even having english subtitles so we get some also international visitors uh, looking at them and so on and so on uh, the other aspect of this uh, situation is this uh, so-called support for for artists they see that some countries including germany already created a system to support uh, not only freelance artists but also companies independent companies who are not able to produce and uh, generate incomes in kosovo yeah there has been some movement in that direction and they uh i think allocated some 5 million euros that is now in process of being restructured and uh, it will be dedicated not only for for uh for for cultural sector but also for for the sport but at least you know something is is moving it is good sign and this is the bright uh, side of the story and the, the other side i will i will continue after uh so there is another aspect that is more positive in this let's call it dark side of this uh, pandemic is that playwrights are using this time to to write plays i mean uh, locked home with less responsibilities uh, uh, i don't know office work or whatever they they would do in normal life you know they find themselves writing and i, I was listening today to a uh online conversation and mark ravenhill also said that he is writing you know he's uh, using this time to to write so for some playwrights this seems to be a good and produ productive period i mean myself i what i did first two weeks were a bit complicated uh, eating and drinking and you know just hoping that this will pass soon but of course not but then after two weeks somehow i catched the rhythm i went to my uh library and i started to kind of create some order because it was like when a bomb falls it, you know books were everywhere so I, there was no system so at least i i created something and you know i started to to write and so on so all in all for us it's not that dramatic i mean for us playwrights but of course we miss the uh being in touch with the theater and visiting theater and meeting friends and all that so how is the situation there in Santa Monica? <laughs> <laughs> well, it um, it's it's somewhat similar. Let me uh, pick up on your last point first. Um, Frederick gives me a hard time because she says I've never been happier than right now, uh, and it, uh, just for me, it's the same thing because I can write without distractions. And um, you know, ordinarily uh, in our usual life, I'm I'm very busy with all the administrative aspects of the theater, and um, you know, because I produce all the shows while she directs all the shows, I kept very busy with all the sort of day to day of, well, just a million sort of administrative things since we're such a small group. 
um, at the moment, I'm kind of forced into the position where I can just be home writing all day long. And so in a way, I'm, I'm quite content on a personal level. Um, on, on the flip side, the, our situation is much like yours. Uh, March 15th, we were shut down entirely. And since then, you know, obviously have not been able to operate at all. Um, we, uh, Frederick was in the midst of rehearsing um, Margaret Atwood's The Penelope Ad. Uh, and we were getting ready to open in the middle of April. She was very excited about the production, had a great group of um, women. Um, I don't know if you know, know the piece, but it's, it's a retelling of the um, Odyssey from Penelope's point of view. It's an all-female cast that play all the roles, male and female. Um, you know, it was a piece she was really having a lot of fun with, and the, act the actresses, the actors were too. Um, we had to, you know, stop, stop dead with that, of course, and now we're not sure when exactly we can resume that. That is what we'll, we'll go back to when we can. Mm -hmm. But uh, like you, it seems that in Santa Monica, you know, they've, they've basically said April and May is the shutdown and they may start some gradual reopening fairly soon, but it seems like performance uh, or public gatherings like theater mm -hmm. are gonna be very um, late in the process. We, we'd be surprised if we are able to do something in September and mm -hmm. under what conditions, we're not sure yet what that might be. Um, because we have less than 50 seats, maybe we fall, we'll fall under some different designation, I don't know. But you know, we're waiting to see about that. Um, in the meantime, you know, we've had the same financial crisis, I think, as most small arts organizations have had. Um, we've you know, applied to all the various sort of federal government support uh, relief funding that's out there. We uh, are waiting to see how we're gonna do with some of that. And on the most sort of immediate level, because um, our theater is, um, is located on city property and theoretically our landlord is the city of Santa Monica, we've appealed to them to uh, forgive the rent for the period of the shutdown. And then once we can resume again, based on the conditions, to maybe cut our rent in half. And we're hoping that if we're successful with those that we actually will be able to then continue to operate financially. In the meantime, we've been doing uh, also much what you described. Our, the members of our company have been doing what we call the City Garage Virtual Cabaret. And so each, each day they've been posting a new short video performance mm -hmm. of a, a monologue or a, a piece from a, a role that they had done before. And that gets posted to our Chuffed page, which is where we're um, basically soliciting uh, donations in order to kind of weather the storm. We've been actually, I think, like you, surprised and pleased to see what a level of response there is. We're getting basically, you know, small donations every day um, and that it's continued a sort of little trickle of cash into the organization, which is vital. Um, and then we've also, you know, created our uh, YouTube channel where we're so on, on weekends now, we're starting to uh, broadcast productions from the past from eight o'clock on Fridays through midnight on Sunday and soliciting like a pay what you can donation, uh, much like we do with our usual Sunday performances when the theater is operating. So um, artistically, that's how we're staying alive right now is through these small performances. Frederick is very involved in that and she is in touch with all the members each day about the work that they're doing. And then in organizing the uh, whatever performance is gonna be happening over the weekend, which, which show from the past, you know, we're gonna be able to do. But I, luckily we've got a fairly large stock of plays from the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started with some older things recently, like um, last weekend we did uh, our version of Frederick of Prussia, George W's Dream of Sleep, mm -hmm. which was um, sort of a riff on the Heiner Muller texts, uh, which we did back in 2004. And um, then uh, this weekend coming up, we're doing The Empire Builders by uh, Boris Vian, uh, which is a production that Frederick did again back in 2004 and really liked. So that's the way we're staying busy right now, but there's great uncertainty about the future and what theater is gonna look like um, until there's a, a vaccine and until people really feel comfortable. We're not sure to what extent people are gonna be comfortable coming back into a performance environment. And you know. Charles, is there any, let's say, 
or can you imagine any governmental support for the independent theater scene or for a freelance artist or anything like that? Or is this impossible in, in the States? Um, do you mean direct uh, support for artists themselves? Yes, individual artists or like companies like yours that are only generating incomes through, you know, individual donations and uh, the, the, tickets. The, the, yeah. As you might imagine, in the United States, the priority with all the emergency funding has been um, small business and, and, and banks and, <laughs> and the larger elements of the economy. And unfortunately, in the bills that they pass so far, it's a relatively uh, minuscule amount of money that they devoted to the arts. And unfortunately, that's being administered through the NEA. Um, and uh, that, at least the first round of funding, was really only directed toward programs that are already being funded by the NEA, which is a very tiny, tiny group in the United States. So what we've been advocating through uh, various sort of political um, organizations like Californians for the Arts and Americans for the Arts is that uh, Congress and the relief bill set aside uh, pools of money that can go to the states, block grants basically, that can be administered by the states in California, it would be the California Arts Commission, to see whether they would have a much better way of, of getting money to organizations that that need support because you know we're, in the United States of course the arts are always the last in line uh, they're they're the most disposable part of the uh, economy uh, it's always been a sort of fend for yourself environment for artists and I'm hoping that maybe this will be an opportunity to to some extent rectify that. Mm -hmm. And politically, I mean, what is, uh, I, I can start this by uh, explaining what is going on in here at least, but I would be also interested to hear what is going on there. Of course, we try to follow and we have this uh, uh, opportunity that we understand a little bit English so we can follow you easily, you guys, while you don't understand our languages. So you have more or less no clue what is going on here. So we have this, uh, advantage so to say but let's say <clears throat> i mean of course i don't want to sound d d dramatic but uh, let's say a couple of days ago uh, or maybe it was yesterday the german newspaper der spiegel was pu publishing an article and describing the situation with covid-19 in serbia and how its president uh, vucic was in fact acting and presenting the situation as alarming as is as it was a state of war you know you see him everywhere in in, in television alarmed and uh, you know visiting hospitals and the television going the national television going after him so he took all the responsibilities in his hands the responsibilities and the power so he's the one in charge and of course he wants to He's portraying him, himself as some sort of Superman who is uh, kind of saving the nation in this uh, dramatic situation. It is dramatic, but I mean, the way he's, uh, he's doing sounds also a little bit uh, ridiculous. So, uh, and you know, the, the situation is that there will be elections soon after the pandemic, there will be elections soon. So he's trying to, to gain power through and using this uh, pandemic in Kosovo. It was more or less, it is more or less the same situation, but in middle of the crisis in, in March, uh, government fell down. And now the president is trying to install some, a new government, uh, leaving aside the party who, who, who won the, the, the elections. So he can, so the president then can get more uh, power for himself. And I think, uh, you know, similar cases are, are also in, in Hungary, in Albania also, there are some tendencies like this, not to mention Turkey where Erdogan already had the total, total power, so to say. And so the, for me, the pandemic is, uh, is helping in, in creation of those new autocrats uh, in, 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 in countries like, like those in, in the region. And I, I'm sure there are lots of other examples like this. But also there's a tendency in, in Europe, I mean, following this economical crisis, because it is some economical crisis, and the, the, the real one will follow after this pandemic is, uh, is, is finished, so to say, it's over. So th there is some sort of losing the sense of solid solidarity 
borders are closed and every nation, every country is somehow concerned with its own uh, problems. And then, of course, the solidarity that was existing for the last developed countries uh, is going to to stop at some point. I think I I hope not, but I think this is what what is going to to happen. And uh, the question for me is, what is going to happen to to those uh, to all societies after the pandemic? It's hard to predict. And how will theater respond? This is also hard to uh, to predict. And will it, will theater have some strength to respond properly? I mean. Uh, those are for me big, big, uh, big questions, and uh, I was thinking that I, I hope we don't become or we don't turn ourselves into some Cinderella com complex, submitting to those authoritarian uh, appetites of our politicians and hoping for I don't know some some prince to come and save us. Uh, so in, in any case, I, I think the struggle of, of, of theater, of, or of artists will, will continue in, in one or in another format or in one or in another, in other, another version. I was uh, reading yesterday a, a quote, I don't remember by whom, that was describing and explaining how governments, but especially authoritarian governments, want to transform people into some children just so we so you know we look then we can then look at the at the politicians at the government as the as at the figure of the of the father of the father so they can educate us they can teach us they can guide us and we trust and we believe them blindly and so i hope uh, i mean my my hope is that after this uh, pandemic we will be grown up again to understand that we shall continue doing theater and good theater that is my kind of uh, let's let's say utopian wish after this pandemic that we we don't know when it's going to 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 end i mean there are you know specialist uh, uh, doctors who say soon there are some who predict it will be in two in two years nevertheless uh, i mean we will not be the same i don't think we will be able to continue in the same way we were, we were uh, producing and doing theater uh, just uh, two or three months ago. I mean, I'm sure we will find a way uh, we adapt easily and uh, theater survived for like 2000 years now. I'm sure it will find a way to, to act and to adapt to the new circumstances. The only question is if we are going to make it under the political uh, and social changes within our countries. Will we have strength to uh, to oppose and to to act? Because you know, in 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 countries like let's say Turkey, where a dictator like Erdogan has complete uh, power and control over its its people, and uh, in theater, it's not easy to do theater. It's not easy to uh, uh, to oppose. It's you. Um... You kind of answered one of the questions that I had wanted to ask you, which was what, what change do you hope to see coming out of this? And so um, with, I, I kind of, I subscribe to your utopian version, I guess, of that uh, to this extent in this country, at least, which is the, the last three and a half years have been so concerning to many people in this country that I'm hoping that the situation in a way helps to wake people up uh, shakes things up, helps them see more clearly uh, and act more responsibly according to the principles that um, I think a large majority of Americans still subscribe to, but have been seriously compromised over the last uh, 20 years or so. And so I'm hoping that we emerge from this with a greater sense of priorities about what we value in society, what we're looking for from government, and what we expect of our leadership. Um, you know, it's curious, you make a point about the autocrats and would-be autocrats in Europe. And I've been struck by the fact that in this country, it was a golden opportunity for our would-be autocrat to seize control of the situation and portray himself as the great hero of the nation. Instead, he seems to lack the energy or the ambition to even do that. 
um, and instead would rather let basically let chaos take place instead. And my hope is that there will be a election in November um, and that things will then possibly start to move in a new, new direction in this country and a more responsible one. Well, we hope more than, than you actually, because uh, I mean, there is, uh, there are people who link this uh, complications with our government, with the situation in, in the USA, actually the uh, uh, Grenell, this uh, special envoy of, of Trump for the cost of a Serbian dialogue. He was putting lots of pressure in, in our politicians because uh, Trump is very interested to uh, have a deal uh, between Kosovo and Serbia, a kind of peace agreement that should be signed in the White House just before elections. So he can present that as some sort of uh, diplomatic victory, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, the, for them, it doesn't matter the content of, of the of the agreement, but they just want an agreement fast and they want to see two signatures on, on bottom of the, of the paper. So mm -hmm. the, the actual prime minister was interested mostly in the content. What is this agreement going to be? And uh, of course he, he believes that a, 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 a bad, bad agreement will not serve and will not uh, achieve any kind of success, so to say knowing the region and knowing how much, uh, I mean, how much pressure the, the past and the history can, can, can put on, on, the, on the actuality and on the future. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, now this brings me to, the, to another question I wanted to, to ask you because I'm, I've been following the repertory of your theater and, uh, you know, you see plays that are very political and if you compare with lots of, uh, other theaters in the States. This is some sort of, you know, uh, unique theater in a way that, uh, you know, makes people discuss relevant topics while other theaters are mostly, you know, just wanting to entertain, entertain audience and because they, of course, depend on, on the tickets they sell and so they don't want to lose their audience. So they go in the, so to say, uh, easiest version of producing theater and without wanting people, I mean, to make people think and uh, digest, uh, so to say, uh, relevant topics. So what is this? I mean, why do you take this risk and why do you think this is important? Hmm. Well, you know, I think you're right in characterizing the majority of American theater as wanting to tell uh, stories that are emotionally satisfying and to some extent, extent emotionally comforting. Um, that, that there's a, as Brecht used to write about, this need for a kind of emotional catharsis that then allows people to dismiss whatever they've just seen on stage with a, a kind of sense of satisfaction that that's done with. And there's something that... Uh, you said um, um, I, in an interview uh, I read somewhere before that actually I, th I think speaks to what Frederick and I have always felt, which is that you said theater tells the story that needs to be told or theater should tell the story that needs to be told. Mm. I think that for the last 30 years, that's what Frederick and I have been guided by. Um, we've never really paid much attention to what we think people want to see. Um, we want to do the theater that we feel they need to see, not in a provocative sense or a, a combative sense, but more in a sense to address issues that are, are alive and vital, that people are thinking about or should be thinking about, and that help promote uh, a dialogue, um, even if it's within our own limited means, the, the limited number of people that we reach, about issues that, that matter. Um, there's... Um, Oh yeah, something else, you, I, I made a note about this because it was mm. something else you said that I really liked and it was that the theater is and always has been the third missing voice in our society. Um, and uh, for us that missing voice is the one that is not in mainstream entertainment or in the normal media, but, but is actually um, about 
um, the people that are struggling to make sense of the world that they're living in and the times that they're living in. Um, so when we pick a play like Department of Dreams, we're doing that because we know it's going to be a huge box office success. Hmm. And that thousands of people are going to be lining up to see it. But you know, actually, the, the funny thing is that um, when we, what we found is that when we're fully invested in a work um, like yours, Department of Dreams, that that's what people really respond to. And that that actually tends to be what really speaks to people. And, and as a result, more people come. So even though we're not thinking in terms of attendance, that's kind of the result anyway. No, I, I mean, of course, it was also just to explain maybe to the people who are, to those few people who are listening to us, <laughs> that, uh, you know, Department of Dreams was produced last year by your theater. And it, it, it was the world premiere. Mm -hmm. So before it only had some uh, stage readings in, in Athens, Pristina, and London. In Pristina, even only a couple of, of scenes were read. So it was also, you know, surprise for me that it will find its way in, 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 in L.A. But I, I know, I mean, when I wrote it and when it got translated, I was circulating to people here and, in, in, here and there. And uh, many were asking me, ah, you meant, you know, that this is referring to, to Kosovo. Or, no, this is referring to Hungary. Or somebody would say, ah, this is referring to Turkey. And I thought, you know, okay, it makes sense. Hungary was going through those uh, in, in the, let's call it regime of urban and in autocrat most, uh, maybe would be the best word to describe him. And so in Turkey, but then USA, is USA also going in, in, that, in that direction? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also interested, uh, you know, after the, when I, I came to see, to see the play there and I was very happy and I was very curious to see and uh, the way it was produced somehow in this small room that worked for me, it worked perfectly. But then somebody, an, a member of the audience from, who, who has roots from ex Yugoslavia, actually not from ex Yugoslavia, he was somewhere from uh, Georgia or one of, of those uh, countries there, or Kazakhstan, I don't remember, but he was saying, you know, Americans don't understand this play. We understand. So when he said we, he meant, you know, all those places that were under, you know, communism and dictatorship. So I said, well, I hope they will understand it. Americans as well. I mean, otherwise it doesn't make sense. But, you know, it appeared that people there did uh, connect it with the, with the play and, you know, uh, reactions, questions in the, in the panel were, were very, very interesting. Yes, they very much understood it, connected with it, and, and were fascinated and appreciative and scared by it, too. Um, I think in the same way that Kafka's work is international, your work is international, to, to, to be truthful about it. Um, it's not about uh, Kosovo or Albania or, or Soviet Russia or any place. It's any place where the government or the corporate powers or whatever powers it be are striving to co-op people's imagination, control their thoughts, uh, control their souls uh, for the service of, of their own ends. And I think that, um, yes, I think people understood it from an American perspective, but um, we, uh, uh, the work is, is very universal in, I think, trying to find what is the strength of the human spirit that, that uh, fights against that co-optation and uh, what are the consequences of cowardice in the face of it. And I think that's what people really responded to. So uh, let's go back to the, because now I'm also, uh, as you can see, taking the role of uh, moderator, but <laughs> in the meantime, <laughs> discussing, which is uh, not bad, I like it. But uh, I want, and especially because I'm also having wine, so it's a perfect <laughs> I'm my coffee. <laughs> it's too early for, for LA, sorry. But that's nice. Uh, no, I wanted to ask you about, what you know you 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 had the program for for this year will you keep that same program or will it change after this pandemic what are your predictions i i think we will just because the plays that were coming up we really liked the the penelope ad um by by margaret atwood just as you know it's a great piece that frederick is in love with 
um, we um, wanted to um, follow that with um, a, a Carol Churchill play that also speaks to gender politics. Um, and then uh, I've been working on an adaptation of Measure for Measure um, that kind of speaks to our uh, contemporary, you know, social circumstances as well. Um, it, it's hard for probably Frederick to assess until we know when we can operate again and how, but I think we'll probably stick with those uh, productions while we then keep reading and finding um, the works that, that will follow. Um, I think that there's definitely going to be a, a shift in mood and temperament. Uh, and so wanting always to see what are the things that people care about now, what are the issues that are vital now, I'm sure that we'll stay sensitive to that. We generally never plan more than about really nine months or so ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we like to stay agile so in that. Who, who like plans? That. Is it you or Frederic or both? We always kind of do it together collectively. Um, we've never really, um, we never really disagree about anything very much artistically, I've got to say. We're pretty much in alignment in our sensibilities and our concerns. So if I read something that I think she would like, I give it to her and then she tells me yes or no or vice versa. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like that. We, we try to read authors that we think um, are speaking to the things that we care about. And then we just try to make choices about the stuff that we think we can best do justice to, I guess. But you have in mind the audience as well. And do you have in mind that if, you know, this play will bring us some tickets, will be, will be selling some tickets, or you leave this as a second thought? Yeah, I think that's very secondary. I, I think it's more that if we feel like it's a vital piece of work, then we just hope that the audience will feel the same way. And sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. And that's kind of how it's been for 30 years. Yeah, I mean, that's more or less the same for for a playwright, I guess. I mean, for me, the most difficult uh, question is to uh, decide what I'm going to write. I mean, of yeah. course, you have a list of things that you think are, are important, but for me, the question remains, what is emergent to be told right now? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was a couple of uh, uh, months ago having a discussion with a, a colleague of mine from Germany, Roland Schimmerfenig, that you also staged there in, in this topic. And then I said, you know, I, when I start writing, then I, of course, I, I choose topics that are somehow related to, to the uh, context I live but I have in mind that they might be staged somewhere else, but I don't care that much if, you know, this play will not be staged after four or five years because this topic is gone or it will be old fashioned. Mm. Because I think if, if there is a good play uh, or if it's reflecting some uh, important issues, then it should remain. It will be relevant for, for uh, more than a season. I mean, when we speak of corruption, uh, this is, you know, has been forever, I guess, and will remain in, in our societies for many other years. It will be transformed in a in different version, but it still will be remain a topic to be to be addressed. And uh, you know, some some others they try to to write plays that are more universal, so to say that do cover uh, issues that are, I don't know, reflecting wider, wider problems. But I mean, as, as they say, the principle of universalism is as much as local as, as it is, as much as universal it, it, it will be. So I don't see that as, as a problem. For me, theater is, is now. I mean, we have to speak now. We have to communicate to the audience now. Mm -hmm. If you know, in next season, a couple of years ago, somebody else de will decide to stage that same play. Fine, if not, you know, I, I write the, the new play. But the, the, the reality is that, you know, lots of other plays that I was thinking, you know, this is only for, for cost of audiences. This will never find its way to uh, other audiences got staged in, uh, in other countries. 
even mm -hmm. I mean when I went to see uh, one flew over the cost of a theater in Istanbul produced by National Theater mm -hmm. there uh, the director was saying was telling me that look you're here but many people believe still believe that you do not exist that this is a, that this is a play written by a Turkish playwright but <laughs> I'm using just a you know nickname mm -hmm. a kind of Kosovan name of the author just so they would believe that this is not related to Turkey but it's written for for Kosovo and I guess you know we share similar problems in in one or in in, in another way I mean who would have believed that uh, you know we would uh, have a play on totalitarianism and authoritarianism that would suit American audience I mean for us, in our in our eyes, USA was the cradle of freedom, and you know, now it's it's the opposite, and we, we see that happening not only in, in the the you know this Eastern Bloc, so to say, that had some tradition, but in in also uh, countries like like USA. Yes, uh, yeah, I think that that's the the ambition is that if you do the work concretely and specifically enough about the immediate that the universal will emerge. Um, and that some, some work, yes, is more specific to its time and place, but um, I guess the hope is that if it's done well enough, it, 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 it survives you know, perhaps for a little, little longer. There is some sort of self-censorship uh, in this, at least in this writing process, because when I start to write the play, one thing or not, I have in mind that it will it will be translated in another language. And if I I don't know if I would want to use some richness of the Albanian language and use some expressions that would only work only here. I am aware that this expression, this sentence, will not function in in some other in other context in other language, so to say. So I you know then I try to find the uh, uh, to find. Uh, other ways uh, of of saying the same thing with with uh, with this different words, so to say. So I, I think this process is is very very interesting, and I think they are warning us that we have uh, almost reached the the time. Okay, in two four minutes, but that's two four minutes in 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 conversation. Yeah, it's uh, huge, especially if if I was speaking a lot. So I, I give the floor to Charles maybe to, to conclude. Well, um, I, I would just like to end on, we're looking forward to the next work of Yeton Nezaraj that you're sending to us that we can do because we love your work and, and want to have you back here in uh, Los Angeles as soon as they'll let us do theater again. Well, thank you. And I'm looking forward to come and I, I enjoyed, enjoyed being there. And uh, I mean, of course, I enjoy being in every theater. It feels like being home, definitely. And uh, I don't know who said recently that, you know, maybe it was Roberto Ciulli that was saying that my nationality is theater. You know, we belong to the theater. So we mm -hmm. get connected easily to, uh, as I was connected very easily to you and Frederic that I, I liked very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to the next work we do, or here and there, or maybe we bring you over to the Balkans. So we yeah, definitely. I, I know I know Frederick wants to come and direct one of your pieces there in Kosovo. We'll we'll find a way to to bring her. I okay. Think, uh, yes, and that's an absolutely wonderful concept to close in this idea of being a citizen of the theater. I mean, just here now we've we've with those of us who are logged in, we're covering quite a few, quite a few countries. And then when this, when we go online, I'm sure it'll reach even more people. So thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating being a sort of fly on the wall in this discussion, which you've used. Um, for those of you who will, who will be watching online later, we have um, Department of Dreams on the Theatre Times website as part of the IOTF. And I feel that you've used the main threads and questions uh, that are raised in that show in your discussion today. So it's been it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank oh, great you. To you. Good to see you, Nez. Take care.